everybody's back. Uh, we are now going to talk about regional network. That is the component of Seopumulele in the orange frame. So th that is us. Now I'm first going to introduce the uh, regional leads. And when I mention your name, just put up your hand, please. Nswandili Kumalo, DUT Coordinator of Student Development and Student Success from the Center for Excellence in Learning and Training. Thanks. Vazili Mdluli, VITS, Team Leader Institutional Research. Did I pronounce that? I'm sure you correctly. Oh, it was fine. <laughs> Riasna Sidal Dean, UCF, Deputy Director, Academic Development Program. Oh, UCT. Oh, I didn't know you didn't start your own university, sorry. <laughs> I'm Francois Stradum, Senior Director, Center for Teaching and Learning. We also have members that were part of the regional networks. They were not uh, part of universities, but the whole purpose of this is to involve other universities in the region. Uh, Sina Kupidu, CPUT, um, who is an institutional lead, uh, part of the Western Cape Network Participant Institution. Those details that I mean, I pronounce it incorrectly. Zina, sorry. <laughs> and Arthi Ramroon, MUT, uh, part of the DUT network, a non-network institution. She's a lecturer in the Teaching and Learning Development Center. Thank you. Now, just quickly, what are these regional collaborations all about? And uh, thanks to Luisa, I stole these ideas from his article. The regional approach has been instituted to ensure that as many South African universities as possible derive benefit from the Seopomulele Student Success Initiatives, whether they are participants in the Seopomulele network of institutions or not. Secondly, the key purpose is to build a community of practice in which regional universities can share their approach and experiences of improving student success including lessons learned and information about useful resources and tools that they may have developed. So it's about sharing and learning from each other. It is also an opportunity to discuss challenges or institutional barriers to student success and to put heads together to identify possible solutions. Now, I'm going to just put a few questions and people can answer I think maybe start from Francois to this side. If you don't want to contribute to that question, it's fine. You don't need to answer to each question. But we, we would love to learn from your original experiences. Um, now, the first thing we want to discuss is each regional network has taken a very different approach, made even more challenging with COVID-19. How would you summarize the approach that you took and what were the challenges and how did you overcome them? What were the successes or wins? And we can start, if you're ready, from short. We just need to share this microphone with oh, each other. It's power. There we go. Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, so I represent the Regional uh, Student Success Forum. It's a central region. So uh, now I would cat categorize the, the collaboration. It's, it's informal. The institutions that are part of it is uh, University of the Free State, Central University of Technology, Northwest University, and Salt Likes. And then the TVET colleges are Goldfields, uh, TVET, uh, Mateo TVET, Maluti FET, and Flavius Marenka. So I think our approach has been one, um, it has been more informal, uh, and with that uh, informal nature, um, especially with COVID, it was difficult um, uh, for us to, to meet with all the demands on, on, on people's time. I think what, what has been uh, uh, wonderful about it though, is when we have been able to get together, which is about twice a year roughly, 
Um, every single session was hugely impactful um, because it created this platform where we could have just uh, the topics that we talked about was firstly principles and approaches around student success and a holistic uh, approach to that, uh, scaled responses um, of our efforts and, and how we do we measure impact. So I think and more recently, um, the focus has moved to, in a post-COVID world, how do we uh, engage our students? So I think for, for us, the main challenge uh, has been uh, getting people together. And I think that is a challenge uh, that results from an especially pressurized time, uh, trying to get people to contribute their time freely, which very few of us. Um, have uh, there isn't, uh, but I think for if I were to reflect on on what we get out of it is every single meeting there's there's not one meeting we would have where you didn't learn of a different angle to approach the success work, uh, and now our focus is shifting uh, towards uh, um, now do we know we have institutions of care um, how. Uh, that extends to the data conversation around ethics, but also very importantly, building capacity um, uh, to scale and track the impact that we want to have. So that's what I would say. Uh, thank you so much. Um, from our side, uh, um, and that is the case at N region, of course, uh, we've mainly focused on the inclusivity, um, and that has been the approach that we have adopted. But firstly, um, really making sure that we work amongst ourselves, um, starting from institutional planning, so that the work that we do actually cascades from the uh, uh, strategic direction of the university, and then uh, also invo involving student services uh, departments because they very they play a very uh, crucial uh, role, particularly in the success of students, and then. Uh, of course, once we had, we, had, we had done that work, we then had to include the sister universities that we now are working with, which would include MUT, UNIZULU, and to some degree, uh, uh, UK as well. as well. And why is this important? Because it is because the approach that we took was rather a more holistic uh, student support approach, uh, which extends beyond the classroom, beyond the numbers, but really making sure that we uh, foster and train our students to have a much more positive focus than the deficit approach that we would usually use to our students. Um, so the project that we have, we, we have adopted or that we, we, we are on the process of adopting actually places students at the center of finding solutions, uh, sustainable solutions that is, to the societal challenges that they actually are facing and that the communities are facing. So we have uh, worked on a recycling project which would be led by students and which will then also inculcate this culture of um, student agency where students come up with innovative solutions to, uh, 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 again, the, the challenges that they may be facing or that the communities that are surrounding our, our universities actually are facing. So it's more at a beyond the classroom kind of approach and it places students at the center of being uh, 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 at the forefront of coming up with these solutions. Um, and then lastly, in terms of our own challenges, I think uh, because of this sort of beyond the classroom approach, uh, we've realized that different universities have different priorities and they prioritize different uh, things when it comes to student success. And so it needed then for us to really go back a little bit and say, if we are talking about the beyond the classroom kind of success, the holistic student uh, support and development and success therein, what is it exactly that we are talking about? So strides now have been to start conversations also around developing a framework for holistic student support that we all can possibly adopt and, and then conceptualize into our own universities. Um, so yeah, that has been the key challenge, but on the positive, uh, I think all the universities that we have participated with uh, in the regional meetings, they, we, we bring in different ideas, which then kind of synergize the work that we are trying to do and make it more uh, uh, impactful. 
I think I'll end here for now. Thanks. Um, Charles for VITS. Um, so VITS, at VITS we coordinate the um, GP network. Um, and although it's called the GP network, we do have institutions from other provinces, including um, Limpopo and University of Vienna. Um, and I think that our approach is also inclusivity, um, as well as um, building a culture of um, learning from each other. Um, our institutions are very diverse. Um, we have different student profiles, um, different provinces. We have nine institutions um, in our region. Um, and I think um, that presents an opportunity to be able to learn from each other given how diverse the different universities are. Um, and also, like early on, um, the regional network is something that is new. It wasn't there in cycle one. Um, so we had a little bit of a challenge on how we wanted to structure it. And we learned from UCT, who allowed us to sit in on their first meetings, and we got some ideas that we adapted um, to, our, to our network. Um, one of the challenges was working online. So um, having nine institutions that all want to contribute, that can be quite challenging on an online platform. And we don't also want to keep people for too long. Um, over time, like the engagement, the levels of engagement um, go down. Um, so we decided that, um, like the central region, we want to meet two to three times in a year. But one of those meetings, at least, has to be in person. Um, and there are many advantages of uh, meeting in person. Besides the engagements being more meaningful, um, we find that conversation, the conversations spill over to um, outside the formal, the formal program or agenda, which is what we want um, in our network. Um, so when we are having um, in-person meetings, um, it takes the form of like a mini conference because there are just so many institutions. Um, so the, the, the administrative burden is quite significant. So what we decided was we would rotate hosting the in-person meetings um, between the different institutions in our network. Um, and that is great because we get to explore and experience new campuses. Um, but also, it's an opportunity um, for the different institutions to get input um, from executives, the senior executives, because um, we want this kind of work to be on their radar. Um, and also, we, we think that this is a good uh, platform to capture their interest. Um, and I also want, lastly, finally, to comment on what I think are some of our region's successes. Um, we have nine institutions, but one of the biggest success is really the sustained engagement that we've had from all our um, institutions that are in our region. Um, last year was the first full year of um, regional activities. We had a few um, false starts in 2021, but um, from last year, the engagement and excitement from all the institutions has really been great. Um, and we have encouraged um, institutions that have similar interests um, to work together and partner. And I think that they are able to leverage on the regional network pl uh, platform um, in terms of the project and coordinate the meeting times around that. And I think the whole purpose of um, a regional network is to be a platform that facilitates these kind of um, interactions between the different institutions. Um, thanks, Charles. So, uh, from the University of Cape Town. Um, so, my experience was slightly different. We were a first time seeking a partner. And I must admit, when I saw the grant terms and then it said we had to lead a, <laughs> a regional network, I got the fright of my life. I was like, I'm just starting my own journey in, in learning how to be an institutional lead in this work. What could I possibly have to teach? other institutions. And so I think that kind of, 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 of thinking uh, came, I think came across in our first meetings where it was very clear, or I was very clear that I had a lot to learn and that we could all learn from each other. And I think that um, kind of um, leaning into the notion of collective impact was uh, what has taken our, has created these enabling conditions for us to do the work that we have done so far. I'm not going to comment on benefits because I think Zena will be talking about that. Um, but we've sort of tried to create a, a mutually beneficial community of practice. And so even though, as I said, it was our responsibility to 
quote unquote lead. Um, we really came together in our very first meeting um, to set up a commonly um, acknowledged set of objectives. And in doing this, uh, we were able to set agendas for each of our meetings and, and events going forward that reflected each of our thinking and what we were trying to do. Um, and this, this kind of co-creation methodology uh, was key to holding each other accountable, uh, ensuring we remained aligned with the agenda. I mean, I can pick up the phone and say, Zina, you owe me this thing. I need it, or she can do the same to me. And I think that kind of open, honest communication uh, has been um, uh, quite exceptional, I think, uh, from people that didn't know each other um, to, to being able to do that. And then I have to say one thing. So those of you that know me know I run a very tight meeting. And one of the way reasons that we can do that with the regional network is because we have an excellent organizer sitting over there, and uh, Demokatsu. And the reason why I bring this up is because I think, you know, speaking to Francois's point and, and the administrative concerns, luckily there are just three institutions. So, University of the Western Cape and Cape Peninsula University of Technology, um, that you, what you don't want to do is waste people's time. People who are already time deprived, time poor, the last thing you want people to do is come to a meeting and feel like they haven't achieved anything, and at the next meeting, they don't want to come, right? So I think that has been a important, very important part of, of, of our um, success, or, or our growing success. We're not quite, you know, we haven't finished the work yet, but, um, and so we think that that is the, the key to our methodology. Will we talk? I will talk tomorrow in the uh, in the UCT plenary about uh, some of the work we have done as a regional network. We've had four workshops so far, and we've been deliberate in keeping those actually quite small rather than growing because we want real engagement to happen uh, in those workshops. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow, and Zina will talk about some of the benefits of, of the ways of working um, that we've been doing. Is there another question? It's fine. Uh, I can say for Nelson Mandela University, we have we are four universities in the region. It's us and Rhodes University, University of Fort Lee, and Walter Sassuda University. We only have had online meetings uh, to, during which we, we discuss various topics. We are sort of still getting to know each other properly and uh, finding our way through this regional network. The first one we shared with each other specific projects that we had in terms of student success interventions and our student success programs. And then the next one, we decided to talk a bit about student welfare. And Pumesa did there an excellent presentation with shocking statistics. One doesn't really know what's going on in institutions around student wellness. And the other universities also share with us interventions that they do that particularly focused on student wellness. That was a very interesting one. And then we recently had another meeting where we discuss what we want to do in future and what we want to do with our next meeting. But we've decided the next one we want face to face. I think that's going to make a huge difference to have that personal seeing each other and talking to each other because I think teams can become very dead and isolated. So we're looking much forward to in November have a face to face regional workshop. And hopefully from there, then we will work out a future path for us. Thanks. Now, I've still been given two questions, but maybe... Yeah, I just want to... Sorry, what must I say about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure, sure. CPUT is a participant, you know, we cannot say helpful sometimes. The CPUT uh, is a participant uh, institution who is part of the Western Cape Regional Network and we want to, to know how that works and how it's uh, working well or 
what, what you benefited from it. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Sorry, but the kills at the moment. So I must say that um, when we started out as a participant university, um, in our regional network, we were going to engage as partners rather than a leading institution and a participant institution, because it kind of places a power differential in the group that we felt was not necessary. Um, and I think that once we had established that we were there as equals and we could all contribute to this particular space, it opened up the space for us to think through student success together, differently, um, bring our own context into that particular space. And it also then led to kind of how we approached our meetings, how we shared online, and also how we shared in terms of hosting and when we hosted. And I have to also just reflect on when this started, it started during the pandemic, and I think at that stage, it really also opened up the space for collaboration between universities, because everyone was desperate. Everyone wanted to know what is the other university doing. And so there was an openness and a willingness on the part of universities to share, uh, to give, to receive, to listen, to reflect. And I think that was that became our, our network, regional network space, provided that opportunity for us to really reflect on where we were at and the importance of student success. Because now more than ever, we needed to ensure, because everyone was talking about no student will be left behind. Um, and no one really knew what that meant, because we knew that our students were being left behind, but we needed to really be intentional about how do we actually support our students and how do we give meaning to this work? And so I think, you know, I've, I've summarized just in point four, I think what the benefits were. That's wonderful, I like it the whole. So it really became a space where it was, it was, it was uh, guided by a knowledge sharing, community of practice, and I don't have to go into what community of practice is all about. I think that really guided our, it was the principles that guided our interaction. I think there was also lots of professional development because uh, Yasha was saying, you know, she's coming in as a new lead. What does she have to, to contribute to this particular space? But we found that we had a lot more in common in terms of what we were struggling with. And it wasn't one person's responsibility to come and bring the answers. It came through and out of our discussions and engagements. So there was lots of professional development that happened during our engagement. And then also as peers, you know, we became these academic friends who huddled around the student success fire to learn more about what you're doing. You know, how can we learn from this? And that was really great because I think that we've now created a network that will last us for a very, very long time. And then of course, collective problem solving. Um, I think that was a huge, huge benefit, given the circumstance of the time, but also going forward. We're now uh, dealing with, with data, and I know that it started out as a data discussion, but we moved beyond that. We looked at creative ways of trying to do things, and, and you know, we'll probably share some of that in, in our presentations as well. And then of course, the stage where we find ourselves at now is, we, we needing to share this information in, uh, through our research, and also evaluating what worked, what didn't work, how we could improve. And then lastly, the one thing I think that we shouldn't discount is the ability that this group, this regional network has to be able to influence. Because now we've become not just one person who's shouting madly about what you're doing about student success. We have three universities in the Western Cape who can use our influence and advocate on behalf of student success. And I think that truly is the benefit of, of the regional network. So I'm also just wanting to say thank you to Ashna for holding us together because she is a very runs a tight ship, let's just say that. We're <laughs> laughing and giggling and she's a, can we just get back to what we are doing? <laughs> so I want to thank her for that and then also to Demokhatsa that really just also provided the support that we needed. Thank you. Thank you. After that input, I'm even excited about the regional workshops. <laughs> um, and in the tea, how did you benefit, how did you participate, how did you experience it? Okay, thank you. Actually, before I start, I'd like to thank the CEO Pumalea, the organizational team, for inviting you to be part of this, uh, this discussion. Um, and as you've noted, 
MUT is not formally a member of uh, the CEO Pumalela network uh, as yet, but hopefully we will be in the future, very, very soon, uh, whichever way or form CEO Pumalela might take. Uh, in saying that, uh, in our reflection, I've, I've got three points that I want to, to, to draw attention to. The first is obviously uh, what benefits we've actually gained through the collaborative uh, engagements, through the regional uh, uh, networking, but also remember being an external member to Sia Pumalela, I want to talk about the periphery and how we engage with Sia and just what exactly that meant to us. Um, and some of the challenges that we obviously engage with in that process and the perceptions that we've obviously had uh, as we move through. So with regards to the benefits of engaging in the collaborative uh, engagement, I'd like to thank DUT for engaging that network. Because there was an excellent platform in which we could learn from each other, from all the different institutions at um, KZN. And um, from there, we learned um, and enhanced the programs that we were initiating within that space, because obviously, being not part of SIA, we didn't know what projects were initiated, and then I had learned about the different uh, pathways or the different avenues, that, or focus areas, should I say. Um, and essentially, the space in which I come from is the first year experience and the holistic, which, where we emphasize holistic support. And that then introduced this whole new aspect of student agency, which was something new to us, and then we implemented that in our space, which was actually quite exciting. So not being formally a part of, but being in that conversation, we learned quite a bit from all the institutions that participated in that conversation. Um, also, thank you to DUT for opening up that avenue for workshops. So they initiated workshops in which we could bring our student um, leaders into that space and then um, help them improve on their experience and their skills development. And that was excellent as well. So with regards to the challenges uh, in that aspect, so coming in on the tail end for the regional uh, networking was a bit of a challenge because we had to then think about time and task um, and the benefits that we would actually have in engaging at that point in time, not being formally part of SIA, we don't have the funding that was there, um, and I know participant institutions also don't formally have funding, so we have to access or, or think about how then does this then um, affect our current projects in still reporting back at the end. So we have to really consider this and weigh it out so unfortunately, we did pull out of that particular project, but we want to obviously move forward on any other project that goes forward, but with consideration and with thought. So there's a lot of thought that needs to go into how each of us, um, what we bring to the table, and how each of us engage, and taking that consideration, and I think a lot of us actually highlighted that aspect of time. We engage in a lot of activities within our spaces, and then we have to look at how that then affects what we do and how we do it. Um, oh yes, so, so that also then related to clarity of role, and where I appeal to Ashton, you are such an angel, to create an MOU, uh, even though we didn't use it, but <laughs> those kind of uh, Points of clarity are extremely important. Again, um, when entering into an environment which we did not prior have any knowledge of, and that then brings me to the challenges. So some of the challenges I mentioned the first was obviously um, the funding, the time on task, and then the roles that we play within that space. And then the perceptions that we get obviously from there is the restriction of access. So from the peripheral, access into SIA is not that easy. Access and accessibility. So a lot of um, the engagement would be through, and COVID was amazing, because it got you guys to record your stuff, which we could benefit from. <laughs> Other than that, 
it's this space you either invited into it or not, or you're hearing from the colleagues that I work with, and I've seen a lot of colleagues from other institutions who I do work with, and then we engage and we, we share in that manner. But again, that accessibility is not forthcoming. It's something that's a bit difficult to enter into. Then you think of it as being this old boy, uh, boys club that has an exclusive access point. <laughs> so that's the kind of perception that you would get. And then the isolation that would then lead to that. Um, even though the final perception is of value. And that is something I think we should all take away from. Because what we see, even from the outside, is the true value that Sia Pumalela brings. And as I said, I really, um, have engaged a lot of the colleagues in here in different aspects and in different settings. And then I see all of you in this particular setting where we all bring everything together. And that's the value that we want, the ultimate change that we want to make in light with student success. And I think that's why I say not yet, but we will be there. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Um, there is another question, but you might have already some of you uh, ventured into it, but if you want to contribute, I'm giving you a chance. Um, what do you envision is the next phase of your regional network to make it more sustainable? Well, that's a tricky one, and impactful. Joshua, can we again start on that? <laughs> I think if one listens to, there's no question about the value that there is to have. I think one needs to talk about uh, uh, how do you create focus and prioritization. Now, um, fortunately or unfortunately, there's nothing like a little bit of investment to focus people's attention. So I think already in some of the responses we've seen where there's a designated person that helps with organization. I think we've seen if we want to take things to the next level, we're going to have to think very carefully about that. Because pulling people together that are very busy, or I love your description, uh, time deprived, um, I think if you have somebody that's, so I think there needs to be intentionality. Uh, we have got uh, a long history, it's just uh, several people, it's me and you Charles with a few here, but remember the history. Um, we have got a long history of regional collaboration in higher education in this country, but when the investment in that stopped, it became very difficult to sustain. So I think one must learn from that history and one should think very carefully, if this is a role for Sia Pumalela that's critical, um, I think I, I'm very glad that, that there was the sharing around accessibility. Perceptions of not being accessible could just be because people are just trying to keep their heads above water. But if you have a designated administrative person that facilitates the access, makes the response time quick, then that you will address that kind of problem. So I think if I I do think it's definitely the way to go. Uh, look at what Siap Miller has achieved 70 institutions, there's no reason it can't be all 26 and even more than that. But we are going to need to then invest uh, uh, in, in financial and human resources uh, because your projects need to be, you know, uh, the Cape Higher Education Consortium is the, the longest running consortium. It wasn't the first, that was the free state. But it is the longest running one um, because there's been intentional investment there. Right? So I think that's something we, which one needs to think about. Huge issue, let's unpack it. 
and we did that as a, as a series of four workshops on defining, measuring factors impacting student success and supporting student success. And we brought people from, from our institutions into the room and, and we've had some very great um, conversations around that. So what we, are, what we are planning on doing for the next phase of this, and something we've already started to do, is we now have sort of two parallel processes. The one is how do we unpack what we've already learned. So we t looking at our workshops, we've recorded everything, and we're actually engaging in it in a co collaborative research, with a collaborative research uh, agenda, but at the same time continuing the work of collaborative learning. So we are, uh, the next two uh, workshops we have planned for this, for this coming year, the one is on learning from each other about how we're using integrations across our institutions to, to, to uh, leverage, leverage integration for greater impact. And then um, our last one will be about, for this year, will be about uh, the final year experience as opposed to the first year experience. So we, so, so yeah, so we've got those two parallel processes and we hope to sort of keep those in going as a spiral. Um, thank you. I also want to talk about what we want for the future. Um, for our region, I think that we could do better in aligning with some of the activities that we have with some of the offerings that already exist uh, within the extended Tsiakumela um, network. And we have a long list of gaps and challenges, um, and there are various Tsiakumela platforms that are already um, giving, addressing some of the, of the challenges, um, and we haven't uh, fully leveraged, leveraged that. So I think that um, in the future we want a little bit more integration between the work that we do um, with the work of the service workshops, uh, work streams, um, and I think, yeah, um, that's what we want to improve on moving forward. No, thanks. Um, I think from our end, what would be more important now is the idea that we, we shouldn't really uh, reinvent, the, reinvent the wheel, but but use what we already have and enhance the programs that we already have so that to some degree it also addresses the issue of external or, or additional budgets, but really making sure that that which already exists in the different universities is of course uh, um, uh, influenced by data and it's influenced by, by literature, but importantly then in the spaces where we gather is the, 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 the uh, uh, the network, that's where we really would discuss as to how can we uh, uh, improve on what we already have and make it more impactful for the benefits of our students and for the benefits of ourselves really than uh, starting new things that would make it difficult for us to actually even kick start. So yeah, thanks. Are there any other inputs from the panel or can we open for questions or inputs from the yeah. Okay, any questions or you can make inputs or provide us with more ideas around regional workshops? I guess uh, I'm trying to have us, if I don't know whether it's a question or suggestion, um, but we will get there. <laughs> what I'm trying to get from you with respect to, I do think this is a very great part of this, this organization, if we get it right. Why? Because if we, for instance, with the case at an example, we put the student's interest at heart um, with respect to the content consumption and creation with those projects, an example is a, a simple recycling project like that, they can be able to innovate around that, use IoT, Smart City, and move with that. So I'm trying to suggest, because I'm getting that, there's still levels that you are improving towards. But I'm going to have to uh, throw a few questions um, at some point. 
Does it, uh, let's try to make that stimulate interest. I think you mentioned a very important point that if people start feeling that you're wasting their time, then the sign up and turn up becomes low. And we have observed, we have academic professionals in here that if you are disseminating content that is useless to students, then the class attend, not really useless by the way, they look at that, that there's no need for you for you to tell us about theories of people we don't know if it's not helping us now. So potentially then projects needs to, then we plan our project accordingly, thereby feeding back and improving the communities that these students are coming from. But then at the same time, I'm asking a question now. With respect to the regional networks, do you guys have the targets that you set as lead universities for these other universities? because that can, in a way, improve um, those institutions um, if the lead institution are um, amongst the institutions that are, like, if VETS is leading the likes of those smaller institutions, I'm from those universities, I do know that if there is a few things that needs to, few objective and key points that smaller universities or partners needs to meet, then that can actually improve those institutions, thereby actually influences things like policy around curriculum and all that. Now my question is... Okay, okay, I'm sorry about that. My question stems around... The universities being partner of the, the regional networks, does in any way influence issues around uh, academic career pathway from first degree obtainers to maybe postgraduate with respect to crediting, model crediting and degree recognition and all that? Or it does not do that? If not, then what conversation can you start with the Council of Higher Education to ensure that that becomes part of the future kind of objectives? Thank you. From the panel. <laughs> right. Uh, I think uh, the, the panel already gave some of the answers. The place where you start is building trust. Right? You only build trust if you make time to listen to somebody else's context. Uh, statutory bodies like the CHE, the Modern Higher Education and Training, they can set targets because of where they are in our, the higher education landscape. But in regional work, it is about creating an environment, in my opinion, it's about first and foremost creating an environment of support and an environment of understanding. Once you have that, and you start sharing, and people see it's okay, like Zina said, it's okay that I don't know. Especially because, as you can see, there's a new generation coming in. I'm not going to say who's not part of that generation, because then, <laughs> then, then I offend people in my panel. Right? But I think um, that's the starting point, and that's why this is so, so very important because we can create spaces for the phenomenal talent which we have in the system and the phenomenal talent which we graduate. Thank you, Professor. Uh, another question input? Yeah. Are you closer? Okay. Thank you, I'll be brief. In terms of future plans, are there any multi-institutional projects uh, that are in, 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 in planning phase? And, and if you can enlighten us on those. Because what, what I'm hearing and since yesterday is that we're still doing things. We've broken the silos inside our institutions, but we still need to break the silos across institutions. So are there any projects in the regions that you're planning? Uh, and, and this is uh, besides the ones that exist, the BQ and, and, and other stuff. New, new initiatives and new projects. 
And the second question is, what, what were the misses? What, what were the, what did you fail? What's not working? Thank you. <laughs> well, I can say to you, we should have given it more priority, but you know, with COVID and your daily work that you need to do apart from Seapumalela, it almost goes a bit down the agenda. So yeah, you, and I like the idea that, that Francois put forward that you actually need to invest in human capital for people to assist you with this, to drive it, otherwise it really becomes something that when you've got to write your annual progress report and you see regional workshops, you say, oh, let's quickly find those people and arrange <laughs> <laughs> one. <laughs> In terms of having cross institutional uh, projects, there's no time. There is no time. Um, but you know, in saying that, part of that is that we are also still learning from each other. We're still in that space of learning and sharing, so that we we before we start to necessarily build as a region. So we we are building by learning from each other. So for example. Our colleagues at UWC have already walked the path of a student success framework. We are now learning from them to build on that in our institutions. So, and, and, and they are learning from our processes as well. So in, in, in that way, that, that is in, in a sense cross-institutional collaboration. And then um, to answer your second question, which was what? <laughs> Oh, what didn't work? What didn't work? I would say, uh, in order to, so initially the, the, the issue was working online, um, and it took a while to build that sense of trust, and um, so that was one challenge. But in terms of what I would say is not is not necessarily working, is not having enough time to take the work further. And it, it really is comes down this. It's, we established such a coalition of willing people to do this work. One, another benefit that I think we haven't necessarily talked about, and there's been a point to it in terms of professional development, is there's been a lot of domain building. Like we're all like learning more about our subject. And in spaces where we can often feel isolated within our institutions, not isolated necessarily, but you're a small cog in a very large wheel, um, the, the regional network gives us a space where we have other people who are going through exactly the same things to, to talk about. So collaborations, but not in that, in the way of new projects. We're still all working on what we still have to fix. Um, okay, so on our side, I think, um, KZN was trying to initiate um, a cross-institutional -institu project something that will resonate with all the institution and it was a lot it was quite challenging because there's a lot of time of discussion a lot of time of task that is required and as i mentioned it was on the tail end on our side so we couldn't we couldn't really commit and put that emphasis on it um, but it is possible but it requires a lot of intentional work um, a lot of conversation to find out what we need to place emphasis on so it is possible, and that in itself will also answer your challenge. As well. okay. So just from my side, I think that the work that we've done, uh, we shouldn't discount. Um, we brought together three universities, and you asked, you know, is there something that we're planning to do? We, we're targeting one more university in the Western Cape to come on board. I don't have to mention names. <laughs> um, I think the work that we've done is we now need to find ways of how we share that information beyond just the region. Um, because it's valuable, it's not work that just emanated from the participants in this regional group, but we had students, we had academic staff, we had administrators from all aspects of the university life inputting into this particular framework. And it's now crafting that framework in a, in a way that it could be implemented and contextualized at any university. And I think that is a huge project in itself. 
and for us to now build on that project and to take that forward. So there's lots of exciting opportunities, but I suppose our time deprived is going to be our new buzz, buzzword. Um, I think that that is a real challenge because the individuals who commit to this project really do it because they have um, they, they're passionate about it, um, not because they've been mandated to do it, but because they need to believe in it. So yeah, that's important. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for the responses. I'm not trying to create a dialogue. I, I'm asking this because the, the questions I was asking is because um, we've got common challenges differentiated because of our context. But in the plenary today, I think we learned that we've got common challenges. We've got the similar kind of cohorts of students coming into our different institutions who come with the same challenges, same deficiencies, if I should put it like that. And, and, and here, there's institutions that have very good and promising practices that exist already. And, and, and my question is, how do we plan to duplicate the ones that are working? Because across this institution, many of them have a faculty of engineering that has mechanical engineering, which is the same curriculum, same challenges in terms of maths and, and drawing and so on. But there are institutions that have improved since we started with the Siapu 1.0. Those are the promising case studies and solutions and inter or interventions that have developed and are working. When are we going to see those things rolling over in the institution? We save time because there's already evidence and the other institutions have already failed and perfected the interventions. When are we going to stop being selfish with solutions and share? Because if we want to address the last slide in the plenary by Murray, we're going to have to work together. And, and we just don't have the luxury of time, especially when there are already promising practices and, and interventions in place. So I, I want to encourage my colleagues in the, net, in the regional work networks to probably start, uh, I mean, looking at what, is, what does UCT have that CPUT does not have a UWC that we can now duplicate or replicate in the institution? What does CPUT have? Even if it means that we, we do these things on a trial sort of basis and see if it can be replicated. And then next, time, next year probably we can come and present and say, this worked here, but it didn't work here. Maybe this is because this one is a UOT and this must be the different approach, you know, based on those uh, learnings. We don't have to respond to this. I just want to tell you. No, thank you. I thought it's better to bring uh, the context up to another question. Um, I think at least the national service workshops that I'll talk about tomorrow is serving that purpose in, to some extent, where uh, practices are shared or uh, training are provided to other institutions, etc. You'll hear a bit more about that tomorrow. Yes, Jenny. Thank, thank you. I was going to say uh, exactly what you said, Charles, about the, the national service workshops. That's precisely why they're there. Um, it's for institutions who have done something well, think it's working, to share it with others. And we've got many examples that will be shared with you tomorrow. There's no reason why that can't happen at the regional network too. Um, but I did want to say that I think there is an opportunity, uh, a new opportunity if you like, which is we'll hear on Friday from the Department of Higher Education and Training about the um, University Capacity Development Grant and the possibility of collaborative projects uh, that we can put in for funding um, in this next round. But we would have to, I think, move very fast if there was something that we wanted to do nationally in that respect. Um, but um, Mandisa will elaborate more on Friday about that possibility. Thank you so much. Well, since I'm chairing the panel, I've decided we're going to stop now. <laughs> 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 Bulls!
sorry, now you must speak. <laughs> no, I just want to thank everyone, all the regional chairs and all the, the, uh, the partners, the participants that have been working on it. I think it's been really, really effective. I have a, a question, I could ask the, the national panel too, but as we know, vice chancellors come and go. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. But I was curious, one, if you have any recommendations or techniques to help make that transition so that if you have a vice chancellor that's very strong on student success, how do you try to um, orient the new vice chancellor toward that angle? Or vice versa, maybe one is weak, how do you try to orient the new one towards that? And have you ever used your regional partnerships to help strengthen one of the partners when a vice chancellor has left, or maybe has arrived, who's not as supportive as the prior one? Um, sure, thank you. Uh, if I were to venture, um, I think exactly the example that, that Jenny was given. South Africa is in a tremendously privileged position that our Department of Higher Education and Training has something like the University Capacity Development Grant. Um, I think that it is a unique opportunity where existing funds can be used to help focus attention. I also think um, this person here, in terms of uh, providing data to keep student success on the agenda um, uh, in the funding framework in something like the UCDG. So, Bill, I would say those are mechanisms that we have that we can use. The CA, I, I think, with, with and Britta, also in the, in the new quality uh, assurance frame, there's also a significant uh, focus on student success nationally. Uh, the employability, that definition that um, I shared in the, in the beginning. So we've got a lot of policy instruments that, that can help vice chancellors that come in. Um, and there is capacitation efforts for DVC's academic um, USAP does a lot of work with, with the Vice Chancellor. So, I think student success is, is very firmly on the agenda at several levels. I think what you heard from this panel is capacity for implementation. Capacity is stretched very thin in the institution and that's why the investment is so critical. Um, because that helps create capacity. We do not have a shortage of talent. That's one problem South Africa does not have. Right. So we've got tons and tons of talent. We just need a little bit of investment to create the space to make that happen. And I'm not trying to guilt, guilt you, Bill. <laughs> nobody, nobody has been an ally, as Jenny has said, like Kresge has been. But our, our DEAD colleagues, CHE, you heard witty. People are on board here, they want to see it happen, and I don't think there's a shortage. We just need to work smarter. Thank you, Francois. <clears throat> uh, I would just like to, to thank the panel. You were a great team, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> Then, cool, over lunch, I thought I shouldn't have said to you, if you need to include it, and I just said yes. What, what you must remember, I only picked out a few slides. It's a big report with a lot of data in, and it's broken down by various things. For instance, institutional types, uh, population group gender, major fields of study, seasons. You'll see when the report comes. And then you can see how the different groups of universities separately from UNISA, but we also shouldn't bury UNISA, they're part of us. <laughs> and uh, quite a big part of us, almost a third of our enrollments. Now I'm just teasing you. Thank you everyone. Um, I think we're quite in time for you to get to, yeah, there's five minutes left to get to the parallel sessions. And to other than said, we are basically running off an hour late, just accept that and live with it. So.